When should you get an MRI if you have tennis or golfer's elbow? Hi, this is Alan Willette from Tennis Elbow Classroom, and this is a question I'm often asked by my clients in my clinic and my program members online. So in this episode, we're going to cover this important question and several related ones, such as, do you need an MRI for diagnosis early on, or is it only after you've been suffering from tennis or golfer's elbow for quite some time that you seek out an MRI? after several months, maybe a year, or even longer. If you do get one, what do the results actually mean? And are there any decent alternatives? Let's dig in. Magnetic resonance imaging, MRI for short, is the gold standard when it comes to imaging or seeing what's wrong with soft tissues like muscles, tendons, and ligaments. If there are any significant defects in your tendons or nearby elbow ligaments or other anatomical structures, the MRI will re reveal these in the greatest detail available in modern medicine. This is the best objective measure, although not the only measure, you can get of how severe the damage to your tendon may be. And tendon damage is the essence of what golfers and tennis elbow are. Now, the natural assumption you'll likely have is that this information will be very useful to have. But will it be? After all, it takes a lot of trouble to get an MRI. You have to see a doctor first perhaps an orthopedist, to get the authorization, then make an appointment, travel to a hospital or MRI facility, and you may need to spend a lot of time waiting at the facility. It can take hours out of your day. It's often an unpleasant experience, considering the loud noise and the constraining position you may have to be in. And then there's a cost, which can be substantial, if not covered by insurance, or may still include a sizable copay, even if covered. So the ultimate question to consider before going through all that trouble is, Will the results fundamentally change your treatment strategy or your daily activities? The short answer is that an MRI is probably neither necessary nor useful for most early and midterm tennis and golf example, sufferers. And even some chronic long-term sufferers who have already decided they don't intend to consider surgery. First of all, it's just not necessary for your initial diagnosis. In this era of high-tech medical advances can be very enticing to reach immediately for the latest technology. But an MRI is not necessary whatsoever for the basic initial diagnosis of golfers or tennis elbow. And most doctors will be unlikely to order one for you, even in the middle stages of your, your condition either, which can be up to six months, maybe even longer. The nature and location of your symptoms, plus a simple resistance test or two, is all it takes to diagnose these conditions. And when it starts to become truly necessary is when you've been a long-term sufferer, somewhere between six months to two years, and you're at the point of considering surgery. For more on the question of when is it time to think about surgery, see my related post and podcast on that topic. Otherwise, it's not likely to dramatically change the focus, strategy, or tactics of your treatment, especially if you're not ready to consider surgery. And there is another way to take a look and get an image of the soft tissues of your elbow a lot more easily and in real time without expensive and an inconvenient trip to the MRI center or hospital. If you feel you need some objective measure of what's wrong with your elbow, that option is a sonogram or diagnostic ultrasound, and we'll return to that subject later. However, an MRI is definitely a prerequisite for having surgery. So if you're at your wit's end after suffering for a year or longer and you know, you're about to meet with an orthopedist, they may order an MRI to see if you're a good candidate for surgery. So let's explore what an MRI can show and why it probably isn't worth the trouble or useful if you're not already considering surgery. And an MRI can visualize problems with bones, the joints, and you know, nerves of the elbow, as well as a host of other changes to soft tissues like muscles, tendons, and ligaments. Although when it comes to visualizing defects in bones and their joints, like fractures, the x-ray is superior. Once an MRI is taken, a radiologist, a specialist who interprets medical images, will interpret the scan and write a report of their findings, an essential step in the process. And the main areas of concern in tennis elbow and golfer's elbow are the tendons connecting to the inner and outer elbow. They're not the only structures that may be a source of pain in the elbow area, but we're going to limit our focus to these tendons. The common extensor tendon is the location of tennis elbow. This is the tendon attaching to the outer elbow at a spot called the lateral epicondyle. 
and the common flexor tendon is the location of golfer's elbow. This is the tendon attaching to the inner elbow at a spot called the medial epicondyle. Now we're going to get even a little more technical, but don't worry, there's no test to see if you remember any of this afterward. The primary problems or dysfunctions, disorders with these tendons include the following. Tendon degeneration, called tendinosis usually, which is the most common abnormality seen. If you've had golfer's elbow or tennis elbow for six months or longer, this is the bare minimum of what you can expect on an MRI. Abnormal thickening of the tendon is also quite common. Inflammatory changes, as in tendinitis, can sometimes be seen. But the longer you've had your problem, the less inflammation there typically is, and the more degeneration there tends to be. More on that in a minute. There can be calcification of the tendon, which is also known as uh, calcific tendinosis or tendinitis. This is uh, less common, and it's also a more severe condition, more advanced. And even occasionally bone spurs can show up, which are also called enthesophytes, when growing into tendons. These are on the more rare side and also more severe. And then there are tendon tears, which can be mild, moderate, or severe. And tears are actually less common than people think. But any terror is a more severe finding than any of the, the previous conditions. Now, one of the reasons why it may not be useful to discover by way of an MRI that you have one or more of these abnormalities is they're not entirely unknown in the pain-free population. In other words, there's, there isn't a 100% reliable cause and effect relationship between all of these abnormalities and pain. A certain amount of degenerative change will be present in many tissues the older you get. Not all of it's painful. It's a fact of life that our tissues gradually degrade as we age. You can see this in people's faces. The wrinkles and sagging skin are a sign of collagen and elastin loss and degradation and loss of hydration. Yes, the more severe the changes, the more likely they are to be a source of pain, especially major tears. But even tears are not completely conclusive. There are people with tears, even complete ruptures of some tissues, that are completely pain-free. Now, I have to add the caveat that this is more likely to be the case in other torn tissues, like in ligament, a meniscus, or a labrum, but it can still include tendons. Milder tears can heal. Some moderate tear tears can heal. Major tears likely won't heal. But short of that, mild to moderate tears don't necessarily have to heal or heal completely in order for you to get out of pain. Again, because there isn't a 100% cause and effect relationship between the tears and these other defects seen on the MRI and how much pain you're in. Another reason this information may not be helpful if you're not planning on having surgery is that your treatment and rehab strategy won't necessarily change, as I said earlier. Chances are, if you've already decided not to have surgery or you're going to do everything in your power to heal and recover before giving in to surgery as a last resort, then you're probably going to continue with the same treatment and exercise protocol, regardless of what the MRI shows. Although, you know, if you're facing the fact that what you've been doing up to this point hasn't been effective, you might change your approach based on that alone. Perhaps you feel like you need to try something more aggressive, but short of surgery. But if what you're considering as your possible next step is one of the injection therapies, like prolotherapy, platelet-rich plasma, or stem cell therapy, an MRI is not required nor is it standard protocol to get one prior to having these injections. These procedures are often preceded by an ultrasound or sonogram, screening of your elbow by your orthopedist, and they're usually conducted under real-time sonogram scanning to locate the damaged areas and target the injections, at least with PRP and stem cell treatments. More on sonograms shortly. So let's delve deeper into what all these abnormal things that can be seen on MRI actually mean. One of the most critical points to understand is that the vast majority of, of these dysfunctional changes seen on MRIs with tennis and golfer's elbow are chronic and degenerative, not acute and inflammatory. This is an area of uh, profound confusion because many medical websites still refer to tennis and golfer's elbow as forms of tendonitis or epicondylitis, which suggests an inflammatory condition, and that's not accurate most of the time. And the same sources usually discuss the treating, suppression of inflammation as a necessary and useful treatment for these conditions. 
problem is that these conditions may involve traces of inflammation, especially in their early stages, keeping in mind that inflammation is a natural aspect of the healing process. However, once these conditions become chronic, as in persistent and long-term, we're talking months rather than weeks in this case, the medical research shows these conditions almost always become degenerative. This research goes back decades and is continuously reinforced by an increasing number of MRI scans demonstrating proof of tendon degeneration in current and recent cases. The saddest thing about modern medical treatment of these tendon conditions is that the irrational initial strategy of suppressing inflammation interferes with the body's natural healing response and makes degeneration even more likely to occur or get worse, especially when it comes to cortisone shots. In the article that accompanies this podcast at this point, I have a quote from radiopedia.com on the pathology of tennis elbow. I think it's a little too technical to go into fully here. So check out the article if you want more detail on the pathology of tendons and tennis elbow and the link to my source. The condensed version is that tennis elbow is usually thought to be a chronic condition caused by repetitive stress and overuse that happens gradually over time. There are exceptions sometimes, like direct acute trauma, but we're not going to go into that here. In addition to tendon thickening and calcification, which we talked about earlier, other words like micro tearing and fraying sometimes come up when looking at the pathology of tennis and golfer's elbow, but the operative word here is tendinosis. Again, it's the most common finding seen on MRIs. It means a progressive degenerative breakdown, essentially decay, which is a result of the failure of the normal healthy healing response in and around the tendon for reasons still not completely understood by medical research, I should add. What happens is that the collagen, the most common protein in the body, which the tendon is mostly composed of, gradually degrades, becoming increasingly disorganized, as in not well aligned and parallel as it should be, and weaker. Eventually, after months, or more likely a year or more, the weakened tendon sometimes tears, but significant tears necessitating surgery, or that seem to make a strong case for it, are still on the rare side, single digits. According to surgical statistics, only 3-4% to of diagnosed tennis elbow sufferers end up having surgery, and that's usually for a tear. And we should really consider that percentage is actually much lower if we also consider the likelihood that the majority of tennis elbow sufferers never get diagnosed by a doctor. At least I think the majority of sufferers never get diagnosed based on the people that I see who whether they have or haven't seen a doctor and gotten diagnosed before coming to work with me, and thus they don't end up in the medical statistics. I'm not sure what the stats are for golfer's elbow, only that it's much less common than tennis elbow in general. So that's the good news. Part one, most tennis and golfer's elbow sufferers don't end up needing or having surgery, although perhaps some sufferers that would benefit still decide not to do it for various reasons. And now here comes the good news part two. There is another faster, cheaper, easier option to the MRI scan, or we can think of it as a prelude to it, that you should know about and potentially push for first. And that is the sonogram, also known as the diagnostic ultrasound. This type of imaging scan uses sound waves like the therapeutic ultrasound that you might receive to treat your golfers or tennis elbow in a physical therapy slash physiotherapy clinic. And since we're talking about it, I'm going to state my opinion that therapeutic ultrasound is basically useless, especially the devices you buy online. So don't waste your money on those. But even the professional version used in clinics, in my opinion. Diagnostic ultrasound, on the other hand, uses sound waves to generate an image in real time on a computer screen for diagnostic rather than for treatment purposes, like in fetal health checks. It's not as clear and detailed as an MRI, but in areas where the tendon or other tissue is close to the surface of the body, like the elbow, it can produce a very reliable image. Where this technology best comes into play for tennis and golfer's elbow is as a screening tool and for guiding injections like prolo, PRP, and stem cell therapies, as we mentioned earlier. An orthopedic surgeon would not rely on a sonogram to perform surgery, but a sonogram can be used to rule out significant tears and save you from the need to have an MRI. If there's no evidence of a tear in the sonogram scan, no need for an MRI. If there is evidence of a significant tear, an MRI can be done after that to image it in better detail and confirm the suitability of surgery. 
but this does not seem to be very common practice in surgical clinic settings in the United States, however. It may be in Europe. I've been pondering this for years, wishing that orthopedists would offer this to their patients on the first visit, potentially saving them from the hassle and expense of an MRI. So in conclusion, there's no need to rush out and get an MRI for your tennis or golfer's elbow early on. You don't need it for diagnosis, and what it's likely to tell you isn't likely to change your course of action, at least not in the early stages or time frame, which can be up to a year, and not until you've exhausted all your conservative treatment options and are ready to have surgery if the MRI confirms a moderate to severe tear or other significant damage that would warrant surgery. So if you've been struggling with your injury for six months to a year or longer, strongly feel the need for some objective measure of how severe your tendon injury truly is, and or you're considering one of the injection therapies, prolotherapy, PRP, or stem cell therapy, then a sonogram may be a better, easier, cheaper alternative, at least as a screening tool or an interim measure. But since this isn't standard practice in the U.S., you may have to really push for it on your own behalf if you want it. Okay, that's it for this podcast, and I I want to take a minute to invite you to come on over to the site if you're not already here. That's at tenniselbowclassroom.com. I have dozens of treatment-specific articles on heat versus ice, lotions and creams, braces, acupuncture, cortisone shots, as well as several variations of the injury, such as mouse elbow, pickleball elbow, piano-related injuries, and bikers, swimmers, and dog walkers elbow. And if you're at the point where you need more than just helpful info, if you need a comprehensive guide to show you how to treat these vexing injuries yourself at home, I have that for you too, including both Tennis Elbow and Golfer's Elbow self-help programs. One last thing, if you're listening to this on YouTube, iTunes, Facebook, or any platform where you can like and subscribe, please do subscribe and, and leave me a rating. Thank you. This is Alan Ouellette from Tennis Elbow Classroom. Let's break your vicious cycle.